Whether they're taking off their clothes or risking serious bodily harm, plenty of actors do things during production that they come to regret. From action stars to Oscar winners, these A-listers spoke out about scenes that they wish they'd never filmed. Taylor Lautner has his time as Jacob in the Twilight Saga to thank for his lasting fame. But if you ask him, there's one aspect of his time on set he doesn't look back at with nostalgia. Jacob's werewolf transformations were typically accompanied with the removal of his clothes, giving fans of this series many opportunities to see Lautner's muscular build. That turned out to be many more opportunities than he was ever comfortable with. As he put it, "...if I had to choose, I would never take my shirt off again in a movie, but I guess that's not very realistic." I certainly won't be asking to do it, though. While Lautner takes pride in the effort he put in to get ripped enough to play Jacob, he worries that it gets in the way of people appreciating the work he put in to polish his acting craft. He doesn't want to be seen as just a body, but instead as a competent actor who's qualified for non-beefcake roles. Michael Fassbender kills it pretty much every time he steps or floats in front of the camera. At this point, no one questions his acting abilities, unless they're Michael Fassbender. When shown a clip from X-Men Days of Future Past at a Toronto Film Festival fundraising event, Fassbender looked a little embarrassed to watch his own work. The scene, which depicts Charles Xavier and Magneto having a disagreement, apparently doesn't match the actor's standards for himself. He admitted, "...I don't actually like that performance there, to be honest. I just think it's me shouting. It's just like some dude shouting. Where were you when your own people needed you? Hiding! You and Hank, pretending to be something you're not! Of course, if you're going to be a shouty villain in an X-Men movie, you could get a lot hammier. Just look at Oscar Isaac. Fassbender might not personally agree, but we certainly think that he's magnetic in every scene he's in. Rupert Grint started his Harry Potter journey when he was just 12 years old, meaning that he was in his early 20s for Deathly Hallows Part II. Grint and his co-stars Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson established a sibling-like bond over the course of eight movies, which is why it became awkward when they suddenly had to kiss each other. Ron and Hermione end up together, but Grint wasn't looking forward to filming one particularly intimate moment. He told People magazine, "...I've known Emma since she was literally nine years old, and we had this very brother-sister relationship. It just felt very surreal. I have a memory of her face getting closer and closer. Like, oh my god. I can't really remember anything apart from that." Despite recalling his Harry Potter years with fondness, this was one moment that Grinch would likely be all right forgetting. He continued, "...one take was enough. It was such a huge moment and there was so much expectation. Quite a lot of pressure, actually." Superman is faster than a speeding bullet, and he's more powerful than one, too. Over his many years of heroism, the Man of Steel has had plenty of bullets bounce off his chest. Or in the case of Brandon Routh's version of the character in Superman Returns, his eyeball. Superman has been deflecting projectiles since Action Comics No. 1. But the first actor to portray the character in a live-action film had a reason for his change of heart about Clark Kent's invulnerability to guns. George Reeves, who played the title character in Superman and the Mole Men, came to regret some of his simulated feats of strength. Reeves would often make public appearances throughout the 1950s, and during one of these events, a wide-eyed child decided to bring a loaded firearm in hopes of testing the superhero's imperviousness. Thankfully, no one was harmed, but Reeves later retired the cape in favor of educating children about gun safety. Obviously, none of you can be trusted with guns, so I'm going to take them away from you. As far as Amanda Seyfried and movie musicals are concerned, the actor is probably best remembered as a bride-to-be who meets her three potential dads in Mamma Mia. But that's far from her only singing role. Seyfried also lent her talents to the 2012 adaptation of Les Miserables, even though she's publicly stated that she wishes she contributed a little less. Seyfried starred alongside Hugh Jackman, Russell Crowe, Eddie Redmayne, and Anne Hathaway in the film, which collected over $400 million worldwide and an assortment of accolades. The musical opted to film things a bit differently than most other movies in the genre. Les Miserables recorded live singing performances of its actors, rather than studio recording the tracks on a later date. That sounded like a fun challenge for Seyfried, but when she heard the final product, she was less than satisfied with her own work. Seyfried admitted to Vanity Fair in 2023, "...I knew I wasn't where I wanted to be vocally because I had quit singing for many years. I needed stamina. I needed strength. I needed to be able to sing in real time, and I was pretty weak. It's my one regret. I wish I could do it all over again." Arnold Schwarzenegger may be the biggest action star that ever was, but even he was once a newcomer to the daunting world of acting. Over a decade before The Terminator catapulted him to worldwide fame, a 22-year-old Schwarzenegger stumped his way through his forgettable debut feature, Hercules in New York. 
featuring the Austrian actor going by the stage name Arnold Strong and confusingly co-starring comedian Arnold Stang, Hercules in New York is a lot like what it sounds like. The famed Olympian is transported to the New York City of 1969, where he must adapt to a new world while fighting off villains, including a massive grizzly bear. Fine chariot, but where are the horses? Schwarzenegger, or Strong if you prefer, admits that he wasn't quite camera-ready at the time. Unable to handle the seriousness of co-star Ernest Graves, who portrayed his godly father Zeus, Schwarzenegger regrettably couldn't hold it together for one particular scene. As the actor recalled in his biography, Total Recall, My Unbelievably True Life Story, he really got into it, and that was funny to me. But of course, you're not supposed to laugh on set, you're supposed to help the other performers. That is so important, but I had no clue. When something struck me as funny, I just laughed. He may have been the third actor to portray British super spy James Bond, but Roger Moore might just have the most celebrated run in the role. Appearing as the agent in seven separate films, including fan favorites like The Spy Who Loved Me and Octopussy, Moore is often credited as saving the Bond franchise and making it the popular series it is today. While the actor enjoyed his time as Agent 007, he does regret his behavior before a very intimate scene in his final outing. A View to a Kill was the 14th James Bond movie, featuring Christopher Walken as the evil villain Max Zorin and singer Grace Jones as the unforgettable Mayday. Unfortunately, as Roger Moore admitted in his memoir, his relationship with the newest Bond girl was tumultuous, Moore wrote. Every day in her dressing room, she played very loud rock music that made the walls shake. An afternoon nap was out of the question. I did ask her several times to turn it down, to no avail. One day I snapped. I marched into her room, yanked the plug out, then flung a chair at the wall. The dent is still there. After Moore's explosion, the two performers were forced into their intimate love scene, making for a rather awkward situation. Moore revealed that Jones got him back, writing, I slipped between the sheets. She slid in beside me, bringing with her an enormous black sex toy. Tim Robbins is a towering figure, both in his acting ability and his literal height. He's played roles in award-winning classics like The Shawshank Redemption and Bull Durham, but before those, he took part in one of Marvel Comics' first live-action adaptations ever, 1986's Howard the Duck. Unfortunately, Robbins never loved interacting with the puppet that had been built for Howard. Some parents who brought their kids to see Howard the Duck were shocked to learn that the title character loves reading dirty magazines and hooking up with human women. But Robbins believed that Howard didn't go far enough. He told AV Club, First of all, put it in perspective. George Lucas had just done the Star Wars trilogy. He was producing this movie. The comic book was pretty great. I was thrilled to get the job. It was also more money than I'd ever seen. But walking onto the set the first day, I realized they had miscast the duck. Howard has never quite been pleasant to look at, but Robbins wished that he had been an even odder duck. The actor continued, It looked so pretty and so tame. Howard's a cigar-chomping, rude, skirt-chasing, weird-ass alien. This was just a ton of cute. Are you all right? <laughs> Terrific, Howard. While many actresses have regretted bearing it all in the name of art, it's rarer that a man feels that way, especially an actor better known for doing whatever it takes for a laugh. However, Ben Stiller, the comedian known for uproarious comedies like Zoolander and Tropic Thunder, has opened up about the shame of showing his rear end in the 2004 romantic comedy Along Came Polly. Starring alongside Jennifer Aniston, the romance-driven film involves Stiller's character reconnecting and falling in love with a former classmate. When the two connect for a romantic evening, Stiller's character is convinced to show his bare bottom, but Stiller wishes he hadn't been convinced himself. He revealed in a 2004 BBC interview, The scene was very quick to do. John Hamburg promised me that he would cut it out of the movie if it didn't get a laugh. But to this day, I still don't know if it gets a laugh because I've never stayed long enough to see it. It was only later that Stiller learned that his butt reveal was entirely unnecessary. Stiller continued, I could have had a double, but nobody told me that at the time. Superhero fans can be vicious when it comes to actors portraying their favorite comic book characters in live action, and few people have experienced this firsthand more than George Clooney. His portrayal of the caped crusader and Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin has long been considered the worst of all time by fans, and he'd probably agree with you. In all fairness, no actor in history would have ever been able to truly sell the Batsuit nipples and the Bat credit card, but Clooney still admits that he had a part to play in the movie's failure. As he quite simply put it, 
I did one superhero movie and I f***ed it up so bad. Even though Clooney tried his best with the script he was given, he still thinks that he should have pushed back against some of the dad jokes. He said in a GQ interview, Having said I sucked in it, I can also say that none of these other elements worked either. You know, lines like, Hey, freeze. The heat is on. As George Clooney can tell you, being in a comic book adaptation often isn't always everything it's cracked up to be. And Jessica Alba definitely agrees. Alba played Sue Storm of the Fantastic Four in 2005 and 2007, but she hasn't gone back to the world of superheroes since. That possibly has something to do with a conflict that brewed on the set of Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer between the actor and the film's creative leads. Reportedly, one of the biggest struggles with the Fantastic Four movies involved Alba losing her confidence. The actor put plenty of effort into playing the Invisible Woman, especially for her death scene, but it wasn't enough for the director. Well, actually, he thought it was too much, Alba recalled to Elle magazine. The director was like, it looks too real, it looks too painful, can you be prettier when you cry? Don't do that thing with your face. Just make it flat. We can CGI the tears in." Alba was so negatively affected by the bad times on set that she considered quitting acting altogether. Before becoming a controversial adult, Shia LaBeouf was a less controversial child actor, making the jump to more mature roles. When he was cast as Mutt Williams in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, he probably hoped that it would be the start of a new era of his career. But instead, the legacy sequel ended up being a big old flop that soured him on the idea of participating in established franchises. LaBeouf told the Los Angeles Times in 2010, I feel like I dropped the ball on the legacy that people loved and cherished. You get to monkey swinging and things like that, and you can blame it on the writer, and you can blame it on Steven Spielberg, but the actor's job is to make it come alive and make it work, and I couldn't do it. So that's my fault. Simple. You know, for an old man, you ain't bad in a fight. Thanks a lot. What are you, like 80? Best recognized for her time on Downton Abbey, Jessica Brown Finley made a name for herself on the long-running series despite only appearing in three of the show's six seasons. She hasn't expressed any serious regret about her decision to leave the Emmy-winning historical drama, but an earlier role of hers is one that she looks back on with anything but fondness. In fact, it was her big-screen debut. Findlay had her breakout role in 2011's Albatross alongside Sebastian Koch and Felicity Jones, and the script called for her to take her clothes off. Looking back, she told Radio Times, "...to be honest, Albatross was naivete, and not knowing that I could say no. I had no idea what was going to happen, and thought I was going to be shot from behind." Although the actor ended up doing another short nude scene in the miniseries Labyrinth, she's admitted that she doesn't enjoy the exposure. She continued, "...I think it's awful that women get so criticized about their bodies. It's not something I would do again." In The Phantom Menace, the first of the polarizing Star Wars prequel trilogy, much of the film takes place establishing various debates in the Galactic Senate that led to the creation of the Empire. Terrence Stamp plays Chancellor Valorum, who's ushered out in favor of the secret Sith Lord Palpatine, by a vote of no confidence from Natalie Portman's Queen Amidala. It's about as exciting to watch as an actual Senate hearing, but it's important to the overall plot. This is where Chancellor Valorum's strength will disappear. Stamp was excited at first by the idea of working alongside Portman, confessing an admiration for her earlier roles. Unfortunately, when he actually arrived on set, Portman was nowhere in sight, and he was directed to a piece of paper taped to the wall and told that it was meant to stand in for Portman. His disappointment was palpable, as he simply put it. It was just pretty boring. Plenty of critics agreed with Stamp's assessment, and even though the prequels have been positively reevaluated in recent years, it's hard to argue against it. A romantic drama that takes place in a 1930s circus seemed like a steep task for the stars of Water for Elephants, but Reese Witherspoon and Robert Pattinson brought the lovable tale to life. The pachyderm-infused romance called for Witherspoon to kiss one of Hollywood's most desirable men as Twilight Fever continued to rage. Unfortunately, the big moment wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. While the pair shared the center of the ring during production, the romance was killed by an awful case of the common cold. Pattinson told MTV, "...I was doing it when I had a really bad cold. My nose is running all over the place, and it was in one of the additional photography scenes. And Reese had this wig on, and literally I was wiping my nose on her wig." Witherspoon confirmed that the moment was pretty gross, saying, "...it wasn't appealing. It wasn't pleasant." The actor had a simple warning for anyone hoping to give Pattinson a smooch, "...bring a Sudafed." Deliverance is a classic drama about man against nature and other man, and it's infamous for a scene too graphic to discuss here. 
However, the only open regret from any of the actors comes from one who broke his butt in a different way. In one scene, Burt Reynolds' character is paddling a canoe but finds himself going over a waterfall. Director John Borman wanted to use a dummy, but Reynolds wasn't about to let that happen. Being the literal essence of 1970s masculinity, he insisted on performing his own stunts and going down the waterfall himself. When he actually did it, though, he landed on a bed of rocks that shattered his tailbone. And worst of all, they didn't even get that good a take out of it. Comedian and Burt Reynolds impersonator Norm MacDonald, whom Reynolds had told the story to, recalled to Howard Stern. Next thing he remembers, he's waking up in the hospital. John Borman's at his bedside, and he goes, I said to John, how'd it look on the dailies? And John Borman said, it looked like a dummy falling over a waterfall. You don't beat it. You don't beat this river. Johnny Depp has plenty of haters nowadays, but in the 90s and 2000s, everyone was pretty much in agreement that he was one of the sexiest men in Hollywood. Ava Mendez definitely agreed, so much so that when she got to star alongside him in Once Upon a Time in Mexico, her biggest complaint was that they didn't spend enough time together. In Robert Rodriguez's conclusion to the Mexico trilogy, Depp plays Sheldon Sands, a charming CIA agent aiming to take out a corrupt general. Mendez accompanies him as an AFN operative, with some skeletons in her closet. Even though they end up kissing each other at the end, Sans has to take her out. And not on a date. It's an exciting sequence full of bombastic action, and for Mendez, the highlight was getting to lock lips with Jack Sparrow himself. If she could go back in time to change it, though, she would, so she could get even more action. As she put it, "...all of my screen kisses were the best, though I regret not kissing Johnny Depp for longer. I was so intimidated by him, it was the first time I had worked with an actor who I had crushed on as a little girl." 